what, what the mate is talking about. Where you at? In L.A. or Houston? L.A. L.A. In L.A. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's up, man. You, you, just, you saw that video? Yeah, man. Well, I just caught the intel and you was talking about, um, that's what made me chime in when you was talking about what makes the uh, police department want to have the inclination to, you know, shoot black men or, you know, uh, target African-Americans. So yeah. I was like, yeah, man, this it's crazy. You know, I, I always do my kind of like independent research on things. And, um, you know, one thing I wanted to add to the conversation, a lot of times we don't research history and understanding that, you know, a lot of these things happen, you know, post-slavery. And, uh, you know, I, I know that's always. Think your sound when I I want to hear this man. Hold on. What's going on with the sound? Um okay. sorry. There you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, my mob deep was playing. <laughs> my uh, Bluetooth and my car started playing. Okay. okay, you stopped when you said something about post slavery. Yeah, I was saying, you know, a lot of people don't understand the prison industrial complex started post slavery. When you talk right. about the reconstruction period. Um, when you had slaves being free, they didn't have any jobs to go to, they didn't have any places to be, that's when they started putting vagrant laws into place. And so what you start seeing was um, slavery got reinstituted through the prison complex as a direct means of freeing the slaves. So right after slavery is when you've seen a big boom in the, uh, in the prison industrial complex. And then that's when you start seeing them produce labor through the prison complex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it sounds kind of crazy in one aspect. You had a slave owner who actually cared, so say cared about you because he was your uh, he was your actual owner. Now you have the actual state or the federal government on you. And now you have put into slavery again through the actual government system. So I think uh, a lot of this police enforcement, um, part of their training is a, a part of this long history that we have with, so say, African Americans and the police department stem from my arrival here as slaves, and um, more importantly, um, the police department being formulated. I think uh, the, the second piece of that is you have a lot of ex-military uh, police officers. So when they get either dishonorably discharged or they're dishonorably discharged, either way, um, mm -hmm. A lot of the training that you see taking place in the military isn't per se the same training that you need when you're talking about community. We used to be called peace officers. Right. But now police officers are generally populated with ex-military guys. And so I think a lot of them take that shoot first mentality. Um, they're, war play. Officers. Play. they're war officers. They're not peace officers anymore. <laughs> they're war officers because if you think about the military when they go into combat, they go to kill anything that's moving. You know, they see anything, anything, everything is a threat. Little babies, a lot of people don't see that, but they don't know that. That, But the military, they kill a lot of children and women. They kill everything that, they kill everything. So, I mean, you're right. You're right about them having a lot of uh, ex-military, but they also have a lot of uh, Klansmen and, and, and you know, and, and white nationalists and, and neo-Nazis and people like that who already have sworn to hate the people that they're, uh, the, the, the people that are in the communities that they're going to so-called serve, but they're actually going in there to actually serve like, you remember that back in the day, uh, that was a, was it a movie or, yeah, it was a movie called You Got Served? Yep, I remember that. Well, you know what that mean, I mean, I brought it to you, you know, I can't, I, you know, I, <laughs> That, that, that's, that's got like a negative connotation to it when you say you got served. And that's how American law enforcement is today. You know, they go in with that type of mentality like, yeah, you got served in, in a way that, you know, you got disrespected, you got killed, you know, you got, you got harmed in some kind of way because of my presence. Correct. So what's your solution to it? Now that we, I don't think this is a new conversation in the aspect of us being shocked and aware, right? We're never right. shocked when we see these stories, right? right? 
And so there's always this kind of chasm in the black community with should we comply? Should we not comply? Should we arm ourselves? What's your suggestion on how do we properly handle these situations when we're faced with police office? Police officers. Well, well, because the enemy is listening, just like our, our allies are listening. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things that well, we've tried everything else. It ain't nothing but one more thing to do. So y'all take that like you want to take it. Okay. Because no, we're already doing a lot of other things already. We've been we've tried everything. We tried everything but one thing. <laughs> but arm ourselves. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and and really that's all they really respect anyway at the end of the day. You know, like when black people are uh outraged, they take to the streets and they wanna protest. Mm -hmm. And they say, stop harming us. Stop hurting us. You know, mm -hmm. treat us fairly like you treat everybody else. When right. white folks uh, 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 want to protest and they're outraged, they go wherever they're going with guns. And they, and they tell the police, no, you're gonna get, you better not come over here. I fucking, you better not you come over here if you want to. Like, right. Get back. Don't you come up to me. Don't you touch me. And everybody yeah. right there ready up and locked in arms like ready to ride. You know? Yeah. Like, so showing up to these, I'm going to tell you something, bro. Like, I used to protest in the 90s. Uh, I've protested like, I was very, very active with protesting in the 90s and boycotting. And the thing about protesting, however, though, is that Boycotting is something that you can do from home. You know, all you have to do is just don't fuck with somebody. You know, don't support a business. You know, just don't support. You can do that from home. But protesting uh, often means that people are taken to the streets. When you take to the streets, you're vulnerable. Uh, if you think about protesting in America and pretty much anywhere else, typically the protester is going to be considered the antagonist and the police is going to not be there to protect the protester but the pro the police is going to be there to hope and pray the protester gets out of line so they can ride on them because typically the people in america that protest are the people who are uh who are uh, disenfranchised. So often that happens to be black people or that's, you know, happens to be uh, brown people or that happens to be homosexuals sometimes. So, you know, the gay and lesbian community, whatever. So, but when it comes to black people, anytime black people protest collectively for any issue, they're always going to be opposed by law enforcement. When Law when, when, when white people protest, uh, especially uh, these neo-Nazis and stuff like that, man, it's almost like a it's almost like they're having a family gathering or something with something yeah. with the police yeah. because yeah. it's all cool and laid back. Ain't nobody getting pushed around. They don't, they ain't never find off no gas, tear gas. Yeah. They ain't hit nobody with no beanbags. They ain't got all the heavy armor on. None of that because that's their people. And so the police is typically going to be riding with them. Right. So if you, but you black and you jump out there protesting, the police is going to be against you. So let's just say something pop off at the protest. If something pops off, you're at a disadvantage because the police yeah. got the right because they're there to so-called maintain law and order mm -hmm. and you're being disruptive they can gun you down and ain't nothing gonna happen. Right. I don't want to be in that kind of position. That's too that's a vulnerable position. Correct. If 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 I'm gonna be out there, man, I'm I'm gonna be ready. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be out there ready. Right. You know, for what and I'm and I'm I'm gonna be out there to win if something go down. I'm not gonna be out there, uh yeah, uh we shall overcome <laughs> uh doing all this here, waiting, holding the sign. No yes. justice, no peace. No peace. <laughs> no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. 
Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, right here. All that shit. Yeah. I'm going to be on the offensive side. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be on the win. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to win. I'm not yeah. taking no air. I'm not running. You know what I'm saying? I'm not running. Now, you're going to run. You see? So, to me, you're at a disadvantage when you expose yourself like that. You jump out there yeah. and something go down. Even if you're defending yourself against them and they attack you first, you're going to be the one that is going to receive the brunt of the punishment. You know, even if you win, you knock a few of them down, you're still going to be the one end up in jail or, you know, end up in some type of bad situation. So, yeah, and the, the interesting part about that is, you know, the, the biggest civil rights leader that we pretty much know that's associated with marches, which would be Martin Luther King, even in his last and dying speeches around the end, he was starting to even question the effectiveness of marching even in itself. If you look at his last speech, he talks about a fear of possibly leading his people into a burning house. Yeah. That's one of the phrases that he talked about in his last speech. So I think that, you know, a lot of times we don't look at the whole perspective of even what the effectiveness of the march was. Now, I will say protesting, we're using this word, right? I would say that financial protests, you know, protests and march are two different things. I think that definitely the effectiveness of marches marches are gone away, but we yeah. should still be able to effectively do our own protests without That's a good point. on a face to face activation. Um, That's a good with, point with them, right? That's a good point because there's multiple ways to protest, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and you know, like even if somebody was a physically protest that's fine you know if that's all you feel like you can do that's why a lot of young people are the ones out there protesting because they don't really think they, they don't really that's the first thing that comes to mind i'm just gonna take to the streets i get it i you know i was the exact same way but you can protest with your money you can protest by by uh you know you can make the signs that other people are going to the streets you know with you can uh you can uh uh make phone calls and organize uh, there are several things that you can do to protest. You dig what I'm saying? Right. So um, I get that. That's that's a good point. But as far as like what 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 we should do, there's there's a number of things. It's not just a one. It's not a one tier solution. There's several things that can be done and that should be done. And everybody everybody can do whatever part that they feel that they have they have to do or, or where they fit in. I say everybody get in where you fit in. But one thing that you can absolutely not do if you if you if you claim to be uh, conscious of what's going on and you care about what's happening, you care about your 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 lot in life, your your children, your grandchildren, if you really care, you cannot just simply complain. Because I believe that you know, as human beings, we all have a right to complain if, if, if we feel like some form of injustice has been uh, uh, levied against us. We have some right to complain. But after you complain, do something. Like, what are you going to... It's like me saying, man, man, I got damn leak in the roof. Right. Okay. Let me, well, let me get this bucket right now. As a whole. I'm going to put a bucket right here. Yeah. But then, you know... Six months later, I still got the same bucket right there, and the damn hole is damn near bigger than the, than, 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 yeah. the, uh, than the ceiling is, you know, in the living room. You know, the problem is going to get worse and worse. Like, complaining has never solved anything. Complaining alone has never solved anything. Like I say, you can complain. In fact, it's a, it's, complaining is a natural human emotion. You can complain, but after you complain, do something. What the haters talking about?